Hello everyone, this is Jerome Waddle, and today uh, we're going to do an experiment and I want to use my Dragon Theater just to use it as an example of a theater production of a piece by William Butler Yeats called The Tables of the Law. William Butler Yeats 1865 to 1939, was an Irish poet, dramatist, prose writer, and one of the foremost figures of 20th century literature. From 1900, his poetry grew more physical and realistic. He largely renounced the transcendental beliefs of his youth, though he remained preoccupied with physical and spiritual masks as well as with cyclical theories of life. In 1923, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. In 1897, when he was 32 years old, he wrote the short story, The Tables of Law, and he published it privately until it was published publicly in 1904. The storyline is about a single surviving copy of a certain secret book and its powerful effects upon its owner. The secret book was written by Abbot Joachim of Fiori in the 12th century. For me personally, I had not read anything of Yeats and I was reading a transcript of a lecture given in 2015 by a Jungian analyst, Romano Madeira where he mentioned that Abbot Joachim of Fiora influenced psychologist C.G. Young greatly, as Young was searching for a bridge to connect the ancient and medieval Christian tradition of the Holy Spirit to our times today and to our lack of transcendence that is psychologically translated to our lack of meaning. Young, in his book, Aeon, has a copy of a page from Abbot Joachim of Flora's secret book called The Tree Circles that depict a tree growing from the Old Testament age of the father to the New Testament age of the son and to the coming age of the flourishing of the Holy Spirit. Young described Joachim as foreseeing and representing the evolutional development needed for humankind to finally recognize and confront the effect of their shadow aspects and enter into the age of the Holy Spirit. In Jungian terms, the revelation is to hear the call from the wisdom of Sophia. I also found an interview with the popular psychologist, Jordan Peterson, who has been addressing the meaning crisis and where he related that he once had a request to marry a couple and applied to be a clergyman by forming his own church. And he named it the church of Joachim of Fiora because he said he was influenced by Young's writings about Joachim. I wanted to find out more about Joachim of Fiora, and thanks to the internet, Google gave me the information, and it also alerted me that W.B. Yeats had written a short story about Joachim's secret book. So who is Joachim of Fiori? Joachim of Fiora was Italian, and he lived from 1135 to 1202. And he was Italian, and he was an Italian Christian theologian, Catholic abbot, and the founder of the monastic order of San Giovanni in Fiora. According to theologian Bernard McGinn, Joachim of Fiora is the most important apocalyptic thinker of the whole medieval period. The mystical basis of his teaching is his doctrine of the eternal gospel, founded on an interpretation 
of Revelation 14, 6, which says, Then I saw another angel flying in mid heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Yaakov's theories can be considered millenarian. He believed that history, by analogy with the Trinity, was divided into three fundamental epochs. The age of the father, corresponding to the Old Testament, characterized by obedience of mankind to the rules of God. The age of the son, between the advent of Christ and 1260, represented by the New Testament, when man became the son of God. The age of the Holy Spirit impending a contemplative utopia. The kingdom of the Holy Spirit, a new dispensation of universal love, would proceed from the gospel of Christ, but transcend the letter of it. In this new age, the ecclesiastical organization would be replaced, and the order of the just would rule the church. The order of the just was later identified with the Franciscan order by his followers. Jacob's idea of the age of the Holy Spirit would also later influence the cult of the Holy Spirit, which would in later centuries have considerable impact in Portugal and its colonies and would suffer severe persecution by the Portuguese Inquisition. According to Jacom, only in this third age will it be possible to truly understand the words of God in their deepest meanings and not merely literally. In this period, instead of the parousia, which is the second advent of Christ, a new epic of peace and concord would begin also, a new religious order of spiritual men will arise, thus making the present hierarchy of the church almost unnecessary. Jocum distinguished between the reign of justice or of law in an imperfect society and the reign of freedom in a perfect society. W.B. Yeats's short story, The Tables of the Law, tells about a single surviving copy of a certain secret book by Giacomo of Fiora and its powerful effects on its owner. The owner was Owen Ahern, a monk around 1895 who lived in Dublin, Ireland. The story is told by a narrator, by Owen Ahern's unnamed friend, who we could most likely assume was W.B. Yeats. The reason I decided to make this video and do a reading of the story is that it is also a cautionary tale and tells about the negative consequences that may occur when accessing the spirit world without the proper guidance of a mentor or a spiritual master. The Tables of the Law by William Butler Yeats. Will you permit me, Ahern, I said, to ask you a question, which I have wanted to ask you for years and have not asked because we have grown up nearly strangers. Why did you refuse the gift and almost at the last moment when you and I lived together, you cared neither for wine, women, nor money, and had thoughts for nothing but theology and mysticism. I had watched through dinner for a moment to put my question and ventured now because he had thrown off a little of the reserve and indifference, which ever since his last return from Italy had taken the place of our once close friendship he had just questioned me, too, about certain private and almost sacred things, and my frankness had earned, I thought, a like frankness from him. 
when I began to speak, he was lifting his lips to a glass of that old wine, which he could choose so well and valued so little. And while I spoke, he set it slowly and meditatively down upon the table and held it there. Its deep red light dyeing his long, delicate fingers, the impression of his face and form as they were then is still vivid with me and is inseparable from another and fanciful impression. The impression of a man holding a flame in his naked hand he was to me in that moment the supreme type of our race, which when it has risen above or is sunken below, the formalisms of half education and the rationalisms of conventional affirmation and denial turns away unless my hopes for the world and for the church have made me blind from practical desires and intuitions toward desire so unbounded that no human vessel can contain them, intuition so immaterial that their sudden and far off fire leaves heavy darkness about hand and foot. He had the nature which is half monk, half soldier of fortune, and must needs turn action into dreaming and dreaming into action. And for such, there is no order, no finality, no contentment in this world. When he and I had been students in Paris, we had belonged to a little group which devoted itself to speculations about alchemy and mysticism, more orthodox in most of his beliefs than myself. He had surpassed them in a fanciful hatred of all life. And this hatred had found expression in the curious paradox, half borrowed from some fanatical monk, half invented by himself, that the beautiful arts were sent into the world to overthrow nations, and finally life herself by sowing everywhere unlimited desires, like torches thrown into a burning city. This idea was not at the time, I believe, more than a paradox, a plume of pride youth. And it was only after his return to Ireland that he endured the formation of belief which is coming upon our people in the reawakening of their imaginative life. Presently, he stood up saying, come, I will show you. For you, at any rate, will understand. And taking candles from the table, he lit the way into the long paved passage that led to his private chapel. We passed between the portraits of the Jesuits and priests, some of no little fame his family had given to the church, and engravings and photographs of pictures that had especially moved him, and the few paintings his small fortune, ecked out by an almost penurious abstinence from the things most men desire had enabled him to buy in his travels. The pictures that I knew best, for they had hung their longest, whether reproductions or originals, were of the Cine school, which he had studied for a long time, claiming that it alone of the schools of the world pictured not the world, but what was revealed to saints in their dreams and visions. The Sienese alone among Italians, he would say, could not or would not represent the pride of life, the pleasure and swift movement of sustaining strength or voluptuous flesh. They were so little interested in these things that there often seemed to be no human body at all under the robe of a saint, but they could represent by a bowed head or uplifted face man's reverence before eternity as no others could, and they were at their happiest when mankind had dwindled to a little group silhouetted upon a golden abyss as if they saw the world habitually from far off. When I had praised some school that had dipped deeper into life, he would profess to discover a more intense emotion than life knew in those dark outlines. But even Francisca, who felt 
the supernatural as deeply, he would say, beside the work of Siena, that one finds a faint impurity in his awe, a touch of ghostly terror where love and humbleness has best been all. He had often told me of his hope that by filling his mind with those holy pictures, he would help himself to attain at last to vision and ecstasy and of his disappointment at never getting more than the dreams of curious and broken beauty. But of late, he had added pictures of a different kind. I saw with some resentment new images for the old ones had often made the long, gray, dim, empty, echoing passage become to my eyes a vestibule of eternity. French symbolic pictures that he had brought for a few pounds from little-known painters, English and French pictures of the school of English pre-Raphaelites, and now he stood for a moment and said, I have changed my taste. I'm fascinated a little against my will of these faces where I find the pallor of souls trembling between the excitement of the flesh and the excitement of the spirit and by landscapes that are created by heightening the obscurity and disorder of nature. These landscapes do not stir the imagination of the energies of sanctity, but as to organic dancing and prophetic frenzy Almost every detail of the chapter, which we entered by a narrow Gothic door, whose threshold had been worn smooth by the secret worshippers of the penal times, was vivid in my memory. For it was in this chapel that I had the first and when but a boy been moved by medievalism, which is now, I think, the governing influence in my life. The only thing that seemed new was a square bronze box which stood upon the altar before the six unlighted candles in the ebony crucifix and was like those made in ancient times of more precious substances to hold the sacred books. Ahern made me sit down on an oak bench and having bowed very low before the crucifix, he took the bronze box from the altar and set it down beside me with the box upon his knees. You will perhaps have forgotten, he said, most of what you have read about Jocum of Flora, for he is a little more than a name to even the well-read. He was an abbot in Cortali in the 12th century and is best known for his prophecy called the Book of the Exficio of Capitalism, that the kingdom of the Father was past the kingdom of the sun passing in the kingdom of the spirit yet to come. The kingdom of the spirit was to be a complete triumph of the spirit. The spiritualis intelligentia, he called it, over the dead letter. Uh, Jockham had many followers among the more extreme Franciscans, and these were accused of possessing a secret book called the Liber Inducens Evangelium Eternium. Again and again, groups of visionaries were accused of possessing this terrible book in which the freedom of the Renaissance lay hidden, until at last Pope Alexander IV had it found and cast into the flames. I have here the greatest treasure the world contains. I have a copy of that book and see what great artists have made the robes in which it is wrapped. A greater portion of the book itself is illuminated in the Byzantine style, which so few care for today, but which moves me because these tall, emaciated angels and saints seem to have less relation to the world about us than turn to an abstract pattern of flowing lines that suggest an imagination absorbed in the contemplation of eternity. Even if you do not care for so formal an art, you cannot help seeing that work where there is so much gold and of that purple color which has gold dissolved in it. It was valued at a great price in its day. But it was only at the Renaissance the labor was spent upon it which has made it the priceless thing it is. 
the wooden boards of the cover show by the astrological allegories painted upon them, as by the style of the painting itself, some craftsmen of the school of Francisco Cassi of Ferrara, but the gold clasp and hinges are known to be the work of Benvento Cellini, who made likewise the bronze box and covered it with gods and demons, whose eyes are closed to signify an absorption in the inner light. I took the book in my hands and then again, turning over the gilded, many colored pages, holding it close to the candle to discover the texture of the paper. Where did you get this amazing book? I said, if genuine, and I cannot judge by this light, you have discovered one of the most precious things in the world. It is certainly genuine, he replied. When the original was destroyed, one copy alone remained and was in the hands of a lute player of Florence. So from generation to generation, the story of its wandering passing on with it until it came in possession of the family of Artino and Guli Artino, an artist, a worker in metals, and a student of Kabbalistic heresies of Pico della Mirandola. He spent many nights with me at Rome discussing philosophy, and at last I won his confidence so perfectly that he showed me this, his greatest treasure. And finding out how much I valued it and feeling that he himself was growing old and beyond the help of his teaching, he sold it to me for no great sum, considering its great preciousness. What is the doctrine, I said, some medieval straw splitting about the nature of the Trinity, which is only useful today to show how many things are unimportant to us, which once shook the world. I could never make you understand, he said with a sigh, that nothing is unimportant in belief. But even you will admit that this book goes to the heart. Do you see the tables on which the commandments were written in Latin? I looked at the end of the room opposite the altar and saw that the two marble tablets were gone and that the two large empty tablets of ivory, like large copies of the little tablets we set over our desk, had taken their place. It has swept the commandments of the Father away, he went on, and displaced the commandments of the Son by the commandments of the Holy Spirit. The first book was called Fractura Tabularum. In the first chapter, it mentioned the names of the great artists who made them graven things and likenesses of many things, and adored them and served them. In the second, the names of the great wits who took the name of the Lord or their God in vain. In that long third chapter, set with the emblems of sanctified faces and having wings upon its border, is the praise of breakers of the seventh day and the wasters of the six days who yet live calmly in pleasant days. Those two chapters tell of men and women who rallied upon their parents, remembering that their God was older than the God of their parents. And that which has the sword of Michael for an emblem commands the kings that wrought secret murder and so won for the people of peace that was heavy with love and sleep and many colored raiment. And that with the pale star at the closing has the lives of the noble youths who love the wives of others and were transformed into memories which have transformed many poor hearts into sweet flames. And that with the winged head is the history of the robbers who lived upon the sea or in the desert lives which it compares to the twittering of the string of a bow. And to those two last our fire and gold are devoted to the satirist who bore false witness against their neighbors and yet illustrated eternal wrath and to those that have coveted more than other men in the house of God and all things that are his, which no man has seen and handled except in madness and in dreams. The second book was called Lex Secreta and describes the true inspiration of action, the only eternal evangel, and ends with a vision. 
which he saw among the mountains of La Silla, of his disciples sitting throned in the blue deep of the air, and laughing aloud with a laughter that was like the rustling of the wings of time. I know little of Giacomo Flora, I said, except that Dante sent him in paradise among the great doctors. If he held a heresy so singular, I cannot understand how no rumors of it came to the ears of Dante. And Dante made no peace with the enemies of the church. Giacomo Flora acknowledged openly the authority of the church and even asked that all his published writings and those to be published by his desire after his death should be submitted to censorship of the Pope. He considered that those whose work was to live and not to reveal were children and that the Pope was their father, but he taught in secret that certain others and in always increasing numbers were elected not to live but to reveal that hidden substance of God, which is color and music and softness and a sweet odor, and that these have no father but the Holy Spirit. Just as poets and painters and musicians labor at their works, building them with lawless and lawful things alike, so long as they embody the beauty that is beyond the grave, these children of the Holy Spirit labor at their moments with eyes upon the shining substance on which time has heaped the refuse of creation. For the world only exists to be a tale in the ears of coming generations, and terror and content, birth and death, love and hatred, and the fruit of the tree are but instruments for that supreme art which is to win us from life and gather us into eternity like doves into their dove cots. I shall go away in a little while and travel into many lands that I may know all accidents and destinies. And when I return, I will write my secret law upon those ivory tablets, just as poets and romance writers have written the principles of their art and prefaces. And when I know what principle of life discoverable at first by imagination and instinct I am to express, I will gather my pupils so that they may discover their law in the study of my law, as poets and painters discover their own art of expression by the study of some master. I know nothing certain as yet but this, I am to become completely alive, that is, completely passionate, for beauty is only another name for perfect passion. I shall create the world where the whole lives of men shall be articulated and simplified, as if seventy years were but one moment, or as if they were the leaping of a fish or the opening of a flower. He was pacing up and down, and I listened to the fervor of his words and watched the excitement of his gestures with not a little concern. I had been accustomed to welcome the most singular speculations and had always found them as harmless as the Persian cat who half closes her meditative eyes and stretches out her long claws before my fire. But now I would battle in the interest of orthodoxy even of the commonplace, and yet could find nothing better to say than, it is not necessary to judge everyone by the law, for we also have Christ's commandment of love. He turned and said, looking at me with shining eyes, Johnson Swift made a soul for the gentleman of this city by hating his neighbor as himself. I said, at any rate, you cannot deny that to teach so dangerous a doctrine is to accept a terrible responsibility. Leonardo da Vinci, he replied, has this noble sentence, the hope and desire of returning home to one's former state is like the moth's desire for the light and the man who is constantly longing awaits each month and year deeming that the things he longs for are ever too late in coming, does not perceive that he is longing for his own destruction. 
How then can the pathway which will lead us into the heart of God be other than dangerous? Why should you, who are no materialists, cherish the continuity and order of the world as those who do not have only the world? You do not value the writers who express nothing unless the reason understands how it will make what is called the right more easy. Why then will you deny a like freedom to the supreme art, the art which is the foundation of all arts? Yes, I shall send out of this chapel saints, lovers, rebels, prophets, souls, and will surround themselves with peace, as well as with the nest made with grass and others over whom I shall weep. The dust shall fall for many years over this little box, and then I shall open it, and in the torments which are perhaps the flames of the last day shall come from under the lid. I did not reason with him that night because his excitement was great and I feared to make him angry. And when I called at his house a few days later, he was gone and his house was locked up and empty. I have deeply regretted my failure both to combat his heresy and to test the genuineness of this strange book. Since my conversion, I have indeed done penance for an error which I was only able to measure after some years. Act two. I was walking along the Dublin quays on the side nearest the river about 10 years after our conversation, stopping from time to time to turn over the books on an old bookstall and thinking curiously enough of the terrible destiny of Michael Robartes and his brotherhood when I saw a tall and bit man walking slowly along the other side of the quay. I recognized with a start and a lifeless mask with dim eyes the once resolute and delicate face of Owen R. Hearn. I crossed the quay quickly, but had not gone many yards before he turned away, as though he had seen me and hurried down a side street. I followed, but only to lose him among the intricate streets on the north side of the river. During the next few weeks, I inquired of everyone who had once known him, but he had made himself known to nobody, and I knocked without result at the door of his old house, and it had nearly persuaded myself that I was mistaken, when I saw him again in a narrow street behind the four courts and followed him to the door of his house. I laid my hand on his arm. He turned quite without surprise, and indeed it was possible that to him, whose inner life had soaked up the outer life, a parting of years was a parting from forenoon to afternoon. He stood holding the door half open as though he would keep me from entering and would perhaps have parted from me without further words if I had not said, Owen Ahern, you trusted me once. Will you not trust me again? And tell me what has come of the ideas we discussed in this house 10 years ago. But perhaps you have already forgotten them. You have a right to hear, he said. For since I have told you the ideas, I should tell you the extreme danger they contain, or rather the boundless wickedness they contain. But when you have heard this, we must part and part forever, because I am lost and I must be hidden. I followed him through the paved passage and saw that the corners were choked and the pictures gray with dust and cobwebs and the dust and cobwebs which covered the ruby and sapphire of the saints on the window had made it very dim. He pointed to where the ivory tablets glimmered faintly in the dimness and I saw that they were covered with small writing and went up to them and began to read the writing. It was in Latin and was a elaborate causicity illustrated with many examples, but whether from his own life or from the lives of others, I do not know. I had read but a few sentences when a 
managing that a faint perfume had begun to fill the room. And turning around, ask Owen Arhern if he were lighting the incense. No, he replied and pointed to where the thurible lay rusty and empty on one of the benches. As he spoke, the faint perfume seemed to vanish, and I was persuaded that I had imagined it. Has the philosophy of the Liber Inductus Evangelum Aeternum made you very unhappy, I said. At first, I was full of happiness, he replied, for I felt divine ecstasy, an immortal fire, every passion and every hope and every desire and every dream. And I saw in the shadows under leaves, in the hollow waters, in the eyes of men and women, its image as in a mirror. And it was though I was about to touch the heart of God. Then all changed and I was full of misery, and I said to myself that I was caught in the glittering folds of an enormous serpent and was falling with him through a phantomless abyss, and that henceforth the glittering folds in my world and in my misery it was revealed to me that man can only come to that heart through the sense of separation from it, which we call sin. And I understood that I could not sin because I had discovered the law of my being and could only express or fail to express my being. And I understood that God has made a simple and an arbitrary law that we may sin and repent. He sat down on one of the wooden benches and now became silent. His bowed head and hanging arms and listless body having more of a dejection than any image I have met with in my life or in any art. I went and stood leaning against the altar and watched him, not knowing what I should say. And I noticed his black closely buttoned coat, his short hair and shaven head, which preserved a memory of his priestly ambition and understood how Colossicism had seized him in the midst of the vertigo he called philosophy. And I noticed his lightless eyes and his earth-colored complexion, and understood how she had failed to do more than hold him on the margin. And I was full of an anguish of pity. It may be, he went on, that the angels who hearts are shadows of the divine heart and whose bodies are made of the divine intellect may come to where their longing is always a thirst for the divine ecstasy, the immortal fire that is in passion and hope and desire and dreams. But we whose hearts perish every moment and whose bodies melt away like a sigh must bow and obey. I went nearer to him and said, Prayer and repentance will make you like other men. No, no, he said, I am not among those for whom Christ died, and this is why I must be hidden. I have a leprosy that even eternity cannot cure. I have seen the whole. And how can I come again to believe that a part is the whole? I have lost my soul because I have looked out of the eyes of the angels. Suddenly I saw or imagined that I saw the room darken and faint figures robed in purple and lifting faint torches with arms that gleam like silver bending above Owen Harhan. And I saw or imagined that I saw drops as of burning gum fall from the torches and a heavy purple smoke as of incense come pouring from the flames and sweeping about us. Oh, and Ahern, more happy than I, who have been half initiated into the order of the alchemical rose, and protected perhaps by his great piety, had sunk again into dejection and listlessness, and I saw none of these things, but my knees shook under me, for the purple-robed figures were less faint every moment and now I could hear the hissing of the gum and the torches. They did not appear to see me, for their eyes were upon Owen Arhan, 
And now and again, I could hear them sigh as though sorrow for his sorrow. And presently I heard words which I could not understand except that they were words of sorrow and sweet as though immortal was talking to immortal. Then one of them waved her torch and all the torches waved. And for a moment, it was though some great bird made of flames had fluttered its plumage and a voice cried from far up in the air. He has charged even the angels with folly and they also bow and obey, but let your heart mingle with our hearts. We are wrought of divine ecstasy and your body with our bodies, which are wrought with divine intellect. And at that cry, I understood that the order of the alchemical rose was not of this earth. And that it was still seeking over this earth for whatever souls it could gather in its glittering net. And when all the faces turned towards me and I saw the mild eyes and the unshaken eyelids, I was full of terror. And I thought they're about to fling their torches upon me so that all I held dear, all that bound me to spiritual and social order would be burnt up and my soul left naked and shivering among the winds that blow from beyond this world and from beyond the stars. And then a faint voice cried, why do you fly from our torches that were made out of the trees under which Christ wept in the garden of Gethsemane? Why do you fly from our torches that were made out of sweet wood after it had perished from the world and come to us who made it of old times with our breath? It was not until the door of the house was closed behind my flight and the noise of the street was breaking on my ears that I came back to myself and to a little of my courage. And I have never dared pass the house of Owen Am from that day, even though I believe him to have been driven to some distant country by the spirits whose name is Legion and whose throne is in the indefinite abyss and whom he obeys and cannot see.